go ahead and get started with our last panel. And our last panel is on uh, models and best practices to increase immigrant participation in Catholic institutions. My name is Sally Duffy and I'm a sister of charity and I'm connected with the SC Ministry Foundation and I'm uh, always delighted to attend an event like this and I'm deeply grateful, Don, uh, for, um, I mean this has just been an outstanding day. So uh, I think maybe we can just take a, a moment to thank Don, Rachel, yeah. Brianna. Thank you to all of you for your guidance and involvement and participation in this event. We have three panelists this afternoon. First is Denise Martin, and Denise is the Director of Catholic Education Foundation in Los Angeles, California. We have Kathy Curran. And Kathy is the Senior Director of Public Policy for the Catholic Health Association. And Dr. Osman Aspino, who is the Assistant Professor of Hispanic Ministry and Religious Education at Boston College. Denise is going to start off with talking about the Catholic Education Foundation's work to make Catholic education accessible to immigrant families through scholarship programs, and she will highlight some research that they've done in partnership, a longitudinal study, uh, with Loyola Marymount University. Kathy is going to highlight and talk about the integration work of the Catholic Health Ministry and offer examples across the CHA, um, the Catholic Health Association Affiliate Network. And then uh, Professor Ospino is going to talk about an immigrant ed ed integration in the parish life. And he will share insights from findings of the first national study on Catholic parishes with Hispanic ministry. So we are delighted. And I applaud your um, making it to this point in the day. I, I feel as though my head is about this big and my heart should be about this big. So I thank you in advance for your patience for my presentation. These are three of our beautiful children, by the way. Uh, Hispanic and uh, the young lady in the middle who's on our annual report, which is over on the table over there, is from Congo. never remember this website, so if you want to experience this uh, YouTube video, you're going to have to take one of our, our handouts over there. But I, I was going to show this uh, as an opening to my remarks. Um, it's a, a little clip from Godfather 2, in which uh, Vito Corleone, um, it, obviously the, the subtitles have been changed, explains the internet to his friends. Um, and it's, it's a, it was very... Um, interesting to me on two levels. One was the humor. If you're someone who is into technology, it's very funny. If you're someone who has no interest in technology, it's very funny. Um, and, but it is a wonderful uh, enactment of the challenges that immigrants face on many levels. And it uses language, obviously, um, to um, communicate the many uh, levels on which immigrant families have to learn not only English if they're going to function in this country but also all the sub-languages we have. And when you think about the language evolved in technology it's as foreign to most of us as any foreign language. So it's a, it's a very sobering um, uh, little piece on, on that level as well. But it's also funny. <laughs> The Catholic Education Foundation of Los Angeles 
was founded 25 years ago, just celebrated the 25th anniversary, by then Cardinal Roger Mahoney, oh, well, he was then Archbishop, he's now Cardinal, um, and a group of community leaders, uh, most Catholic but some non-Catholics, who, understanding that Catholic education uh, enrollments had been on the decline for about 20 years at that point, uh, would that the Catholic schools of the Archdiocese of Los Angeles would need some shoring up going forward, and that their sustainability was crucial to the life of the Archdiocese and to the city of Los Angeles, indeed to the, to the nation. Um, so they founded the foundation, which in, in fact is not a 501c3, it is a trust, uh, and it is a part of the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. They founded it to establish an endowment to help fund students who would be attending inner city schools and to also, by, by virtue of the fact of funding the students, uh, also provide greater sustainability for the schools. So our mission is really twofold. We fund students and by virtue, of, by virtue of funding those students we are helping our schools. Now I want to just give you a sense I want to give you a sense of what the Los Angeles Diocese is like in terms of education. The Archdiocese of Los Angeles covers three counties, Santa Barbara County, Ventura, and Los Angeles counties. We have five pastoral regions uh, with, with bishops. We have currently about 80,000 students in pre-K through grade 12. Our capacity is 115,000 students. So we have open seats for about 35,000 students in the Archdiocese. The breakdown of our schools is, um, is interesting in that CEF um, and the work that it's done has, has proved to be um, very important for the sustainability of the schools. We have 219 elementary schools and CEF is funding students in 167 of them. That's 76% of the schools primarily in inner city schools, primarily with Hispanic and African American populations. We have 51 high schools in the Archdiocese. CEF is funding 30, children in 34 of those high schools. When you look at our population, uh, the CEF population of, of students, uh, you'll see that 85% of them are Latino, and that the remaining 15% are um, divided among uh, African Americans, Asians, Caucasians, and mixed race. The average income of a family of four receiving help from the uh, from CEF is about twenty nine thousand dollars at this point. So we're funding families that are at or below the poverty line, uh, children who qualify for fuller or reduced lunch programs, even though those programs are not necessarily available in our schools. Um, and we have, as we set up our, our uh, tuition funding scheme, we have really three columns of eligible students. The poorest of the poor, uh, a sort of middle group that you would probably call the working poor, and then the, those who are doing a bit better. Can you still hear me? That, that being so positive. So that just gives you a sense of, of what our, our profile is like. So we're funding about 9,000 students a year with financial uh, awards, and we'll talk a little bit more about how we do that in a minute. We're also serving families by interacting with parents and garden, guardians directly in the course of admin, uh, distributing these awards. We're serving the schools through uh, enhancing their sustainability and also helping with educational excellence in the schools through funding for special programs, which we'll talk about in a minute. And we serve the church because we really believe that a Catholic education is an advantage for life on every level, whether it be intellectual, emotional, physical, <coughs> social, and most especially spiritual. And we believe that we are serving society by educating the next generation of leaders who will uh, do all of the things that we've been talking about today in terms of their ability to carry forward uh, the church's mission to serve 
of the poor, the disenfranchised, uh, and anyone who comes to our doorstep. So how, how do our programs work? We really work in two arenas. The first is in education, and the second is in outreach. So we have a, a basic tuition assistance program, which I'll describe in a minute, and it has various sub-programs within it that, that sort of help us market to donors um, ways in which they can feel connected to the students whom they're funding. And we fund curricular programs to the extent that donors come to us with ideas they may have for funding art programs or music or sports uh, or field trip programs, whatever the donor's interested in. I anticipate, I, I'm, I have only been in this job for nine months, but I anticipate that we'll be moving more into the arena of assisting schools with the quality of the educational product that they're uh, producing because there's this kind of chicken and egg effect between filling seats and providing the kind of education that the families deserve, but also um, the, the kind of education that's going to attract a greater mixture, particularly in the inner city schools, of socioeconomic diversity. We also engage in outreach in that, in, in administering our programs, we try to engage with families and guardians uh, through the Madrinas program, for instance, that Annette spoke with before, through our uh, project Face to Face, Cara a Cara, which I'll talk about in a minute, and through our alumni programs, which are, are relative, well, they're quite new actually, but they've had such a, initial success that we are very hopeful that our alumni programs uh, will, will reap great benefits for us. And we've begun working with Spanish language media more closely to get the word out about Catholic education being an option for immigrant families. Our tuition assistance program uh, is really rather rudimentary. We offer $1,000 uh, tuition assistance for elementary school students and $2,000 tuition assistance for high school students with an additional $500 offered for students who are considered to be at risk. Children of incarcerated parents, um, foster children, uh, children with extreme home situations, um, and, and that's a partnership between our program officer and the principal who might recommend a student and identify them as being at risk. So our, our tuition awards help the schools, but the catch is they're not really big enough to make it possible for all immigrant families to consider Catholic education. There are many reasons why immigrant families don't consider Catholic education. We started talking about those during the course of the day. The most obvious one is funding, money, but there are also others. For instance, uh, Hispanic families coming from Latin American and South American countries often see Catholic schools as the schools of the elite, because in those countries they are. So we have a big education program that we have to engage in to convince immigrant families, particularly Latino families, that in the United States, the American church runs schools for all of, all of our children and especially for the children of the poor and uh, those of immigrant status. We also uh, have several matching programs that empower schools to raise money and to involve their parents in the, in the uh, process of funding their children's education. And I'm not going to go into the details on those because um, of time, but you can certainly ask me about them. On the outreach side, what we're really concerned with doing here is including is, is including the family or guardians in the process of the education of their child. So we're really looking at the homeschool partnership. We mentioned the Madrinas program, you learned more about that earlier today. We participate in it by giving sort of priority funding to children who are new to Catholic schools but come in through the Madrinas program in the Los Angeles uh, Archdiocese. We have uh, funders for a program uh, in which we uh, bring books into the home. So we have children come 
generally they're, they're preschool through grade two, so my, my office loves to do this program. In the spring, we hold a fair, a book fair, and classes come to one of our high school campuses, and they, the children receive backpacks with books in English and Spanish, and, the, and then we have all kinds of activities for them and games and this and that, and they get to choose a book as well as part of that. When you think about the fact that most American homes probably do not have much of a children's book collection, let alone immigrant homes, uh, where there are, are innumerable barriers to having books in the home, this kind of program is really critical for reinforcing that, that home-school partnership. And we recognize that we really need to be doing a lot more to help educate parents uh, about what it means to be a partner with the school in the education of their child. And this goes all the way through college. Well, I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. So our, we, we started the CSAN network this year with city, city foundation funding. So a city bank in Banamex um, gave us funding for three years to start a mentorship program for first time college, uh, first generation college attendees. And we have about 25 young people in this program. They're all college freshmen in the Los Angeles area. Some of them are living on campus. Most of them are living at home. So we have uh, commuter issues in the group and we have resident issues in the group. They meet once a month at the Caruso Catholic Center at the University of Southern California. And our job is to bring to them a group of mentors, people who are primarily in their late 20s and early 30s, who take delight in working with these young people who are experiencing, for the first time, college in their families. There's generally not a lot of help or information in the home, um, but uh, through, through the mentorship program, they're able to get help with uh, financial aid issues. We're currently setting up to do um, a series of Wednesdays that are gonna be devoted to resume writing, um, speed interviewing, where they're gonna go around and interview with uh, different mentors. Uh, and so we, we balance uh, a mix of speakers for these uh, freshmen with opportunities for them to get to know each other and to share their own experiences about what it's like to be the first in their family to be in college or just to be in college and what, what you have to go through as a freshman. It's been very successful and this year we're going to be moving into the junior year in high school to prepare students to want to be in this program and already some of the um, freshmen soon to be sophomores who are in the program are saying, yes, yes, I want to be a mentor too. I'm going to be a mentor next year. So they're very excited about that. Um, let me, I, I know our time is short, but let me just go back. Um, I didn't really explain the face-to-face -face program or our, our, our program, and that's probably our best outreach effort to date. We, this summer, the staff got together um, as they always do for a staff retreat. And it's a, it's a combination of a business retreat and uh, a reflection time for, a spiritual time for us to get together as a staff. In the course of the retreat, our program manager, Andrew Garcia, came up with this idea about uh, taking the application process for our tuition awards to the schools and to the families who are, who are going to um, apply for tuition assistance. At first we thought this was a great uh, efficiency move on our part because we're, this year we're going to review about 18,000 applications for the 9,000 scholarships that we distribute. And it's a huge job. We bring an, an army of temporary, enthusiastic young people to go through these applications. So Andrew had this idea that if we go to the schools, we could do the renewals right on site with the parents and boy, it would make things so much easier back at the, at the office. Well, we learned more than we thought we would by this program. We tried, decided to pilot it in, I think, three high schools to begin with. And we worked with the school to ha have the school make uh, appointments for families in 15-minute intervals. 
We pre-populated their application forms. These were all families renewing from the prior year. And then we took our group of six Spanish-speaking staff members to the high school to meet with the, with the families face-to-face -to, -face to help them fill out the application. Well, it, it has turned out to be so successful that we're now doing it in 29 of the high schools that we're in, and we're piloting it this week, even as we speak in elementary schools. The thing that is so amazing about it is it, for my staff uh, and me, when I go on site to do this, um, it, it puts a face to every application, obviously. It, um, it makes the whole process of what we're doing more real to us, and it is a tremendous help to the families. The fact that all of my staff uh, that, that do this project speak Spanish is, is an enormous help, as you can imagine. But it goes beyond that. It, goes be, it, it gets into this whole area of how immigrants have to deal with these multiple layers, as in the Vito Corleone um, video, multiple layers of, uh, of interaction and language and complexity just to navigate through the system. So after one of the early pilot um, experiences, the staff came back and uh, Teresa, our program manager, was saying, wow, I had a, a father break down and cry today at the end of his, his finishing his application. And when I asked him what was wrong, he said, he said, you know, my child didn't get a scholarship last year because I just couldn't face filling out this application. It was just too overwhelming for me. And then a, another day she came back and she said, so today I had this, this mother who said, what should I put down as my car? And Teresa said, well, what kind of car do you have? I mean, what, what make or model or year is your car? And the woman said, you know, I don't know. It's an ice cream truck. That was their business. That was their car. If she had been at home doing this by herself, how would she have answered that question? How would she have dealt with that reality? So it's been a very successful program. We're, we're looking forward to rolling it out to as many of our schools that, who want to participate. At the elementary level, we're bringing the elementary school parents to one of our high schools to expose them to the concept of Catholic high school and the possibility for their children as early on as possible uh, to have a, a Catholic high school experience. And we're looking forward to this as, as our principal outreach program. Um, okay, very quickly, on measuring our progress. This is way too complicated for me to get into uh, in any depth. But since 2008, CEF has partnered with Loyola Marymount University um, out by the beach in California on a what we think is probably the first of its kind uh, empirical, multi-phased, longitudinal study of CEF students. And the third phase of the study will be coming out probably the end of March, beginning of April. So I was able to get a little advance information uh, from the uh, uh, principal investigator on the, on the study about it. But what we've done is partner with them to look at uh, the, the, the statistical data that would reinforce our intuitive understanding that the children whom we fund uh, do very well in Catholic school, that in fact they do better in Catholic school than they would in the public school that they would otherwise have gone to uh, had they stayed in, in, gone to public school or stayed in public school. So there are about 600 CEF students in each cohort of the study. Each, each phase of the study has gone deeper into their success uh, as students and their matriculation from 8th grade to 9th grade and 12th grade to uh, higher education. The most amazing thing to me when I, when I started this job and I saw these numbers coming out of the LMU study was that despite the tremendous obstacles that our immigrant families, our, particularly our Latino families is the majority of the people we serve, despite the tremendous obstacles that they go through in their lives um, to uh, 
to survive in this country and to take the step of uh, putting their children in Catholic schools and what that means for them financially, particularly. 98% of these students graduate from high school and 98% go on or are accepted at some sort of higher education. A smaller number in the third phase of the study you'll see actually do go on to higher education, but it's still 92%. This is in a city where fewer than 50%, I think about 47% of public school students actually graduate from high school. So despite what these families are going through as immigrant families, we know that Catholic education works, and it works in a phenomenally big way for them. If you're interested in more information about the LMU series, um, I can give that to you if you want to give me your card. And uh, there are some copies available going back to the early phase of the study. So I would just close by saying that um, the future of Catholic schools is really in the hands of our immigrant families. And our immigrant families are counting on Catholic schools to get them where they need to be in this, in this country. So it's really a two-way street. Um, CEF is very proud to have served for 25 years, and we hope this will go on in, in perpetuity, to serve these families, to support these families, to educate them, to do what we can in the integration and interaction process, and to celebrate with them the cultural riches that they are bringing to our city uh, and to our church and to our, our society as a whole. So I want to just thank you for inviting us today. Um, if we had more time, I would go into more detail about a number of the programs. But please do let me know if you would like to know more about them. And thank you very much. until the almost bitter end. Um, I know it's been a really full and wonderful day. I don't know how you guys managed to pack so much into this day, but it's really been um, eye-opening and, and heartwarming. What I would like to do in my 12 to 15 minutes is to try to give you a quick introduction to the Catholic Health Ministry and the ways that, uh, the opportunities that we have in the Catholic Health Ministry to reach out to and work with and serve immigrants. I want to give you a whirlwind tour of a handful of examples so you can see the kinds of programs that are out there. I want to take a minute after that to reflect on some of the lessons I think we can learn from some of those programs about how to effectively work with immigrants to help them to identify their needs and be integrated into the community. And then I'm going to end with a pitch for uh, to you to reach out and try to be partners with Catholic Healthcare in this endeavor. So first, the Catholic Health Ministry, CHA, is a membership organization representing the Catholic Health Ministry in the United States, which consists of about 650 hospitals, about 1,600 continuing care facilities, and by that we mean skilled nursing homes, home health agencies, uh, hospices, those kinds of assisted living facilities. So you can see that we have over 2,200 uh, separate members of our ministry, most of whom are grouped into larger systems, about 60 or 70 systems around the country. And we are present in all 50 states, not necessarily a hospital in all 50 states, but we do have a Catholic health ministry presence in all 50 states. The ways that we have, the opportunities, that, um, kinds of opportunities that the Catholic health ministry have to reach out to immigrants, obviously starts first with our hospitals. People come to us because they need care, although there are obstacles for immigrants to coming into our facilities, even just for the basic care, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Then we run clinics that are out in the communities that provide um, primary care, prenatal care, pediatric care, mental health care, counseling, a whole host of services in facilities that are located in communities where immigrants will reside. 
Uh, we also do a lot of work, uh, what we call community benefit work, which is sometimes health-related, sometimes only tangentially health-related. But these are projects that we run or we fund or we collaborate in that have been identified through a process called developing a community health needs assessment, which is something Catholic and other not-for-profit hospitals are required to do, but we've been doing for a long time before anyhow. And through that process, you consult with people in the community to identify what they see are the needs and to work with you to figure out, well, these are the needs, what, how can we help to meet some of those needs? Um, and then finally, through workforce and training and employment, whether as employers ourselves of people from all over the country, or uh, participants in programs that help to provide workforce training to immigrants. So that's the quick overview of some of the opportunities we have. And now I, I'm gonna fly through some examples. Again, my goal here is really not to go into much detail in any given program. Um, but to give you a flavor of what's out there. So sometimes what happens is there's a program that has been established for many years um, that we've been doing that needs to be adjusted because new, because uh, the demographics change and new groups come into the community. So for example, in Newport News, Bon Secours Mary Immaculate Hospital since the mid 90s has had a parenting support program where they provide education and support for parents so that they can learn good parenting techniques so that they can learn about child development and be, uh, find other parents to have support systems with. And in 2006, they realized that they were having more and more Spanish speakers in their community. So they developed, they re developed the program to be available to Spanish speakers, but in addition to that, they included, they began to offer English as a second language to folks who needed it. And they began to offer counseling to really address some of the particular problems that immigrant families face. You know, it's hard enough to raise a teenager anyhow, but when you have the problem of the teenagers and the children um, acclimating faster than the parents, that can really exacerbate some of the stresses in the family. Um, so they adjusted their program to uh, meet the needs of the Spanish speakers in, their country, in, the, in the area. One quick example of a clinic, Mercy Ministries in Laredo, Texas, a border town, runs a healthcare clinic, serves mostly low-income and Hispanic residents, some are citizens, some are documented, some are undocumented, but they all struggle to find access to affordable health care that's accessible in terms of being affordable there and, and um, in their language. And this clinic is designed to meet their needs. They offer primary care, nutrition classes, domestic violence education, child care. They have a mobile van that goes into the community and can provide services directly. Um, at community centers, they provide food and clothing to people who need it, and they have a core of health promoters recruited from the community who go into the community to spread the word about various health issues. Now, this is also interesting because this was started by a hospital run by the Mercy System. And eventually, they decided they had to sell the hospital, but they kept their health care presence in the community by using the proceeds to fund continue to fund the clinic. So you'll see that happen, and, and I raise that up to you because that is a hallmark of Catholic health care. The sisters came to this country and were asked to meet the needs in the community. Out of that, we have a wonderful health care system, a wonderful hospital system, but sometimes we find that the needs that are actually in the community aren't hospital-based, they're some kind of other health care need, and so the ministry is adapting to some of the different needs in the communities. These are some of my favorite programs, and I'm going to tell you about now. Um, these are programs that are, were designed to meet the targeted specific needs of specific communities. Um, so in, uh, what, I think I, I dropped my paper, so they're out of order. Hold on a second. There it goes. Okay. Teaneck, New Jersey. There's a large Korean immigrant population in the New York, Connecticut, New Jersey area. Holy Name Medical Center has developed um, a, a resource center for Korean immigrants, a health resource center. It's located on the campus of the medical center. The location itself is very welcoming. They, Korean language speakers can go there to get assistance in getting connected up with primary care doctors and other health care uh, providers. They can get Korean meals there. They can watch Korean soap operas in the, uh, in the waiting room while they're waiting. They have a, a core of drivers who speak Korean who will help them with transportation issues. They um, engage in extensive outreach and communication into the Korean community going into churches. They have a special campaign targeting hepatitis 
B, which apparently is particularly prevalent in Asian communities and is a big problem. Um, they also run health fairs and target other public health issues that are of concern to the community as well, diabetes awareness, for example. So it, it's really identifying what the needs of the Korean community are, providing culturally appropriate um, location where they can have those needs met, but then also going into the community to bring them in. in uh, Mercy, California, Mercy Medical Center, there are a lot of Hmong immigrants in that area. After, uh, after the U.S. got out of Vietnam, there was a huge influx of Hmong immigrants out of Laos into the United States. Um, and they came, many of them, their, their culture is very much based in sort of traditional spiritual forms of healing, Western culture, Western medicine, was completely foreign to them and continues to be. It's a very, uh, their, their cultural identity has really remained strong. So they were having a really big problem because they would want, when they got sick, they wanted to stay in their homes and have their traditional healers come and perform traditional ceremonies before they would go to the hospital. The problem is it would cause delays and often by the time they got to the hospital, they were very sick, they, perhaps it was too late, and there was just no trust they, they feared Western medicine, they feared doctors. So what this hospital did was it started a program and it connected up with the, with the shamans, the Hmong shamans, and it invited them in and they provide 40 hours of training um, and outreach to the Hmong shamans. They uh, introduced them to concepts of, Western, uh, uh, concepts of Western medicine. They tour them around the hospital so they can see surgery and radiology and pediatrics and maternity. And once they've completed it, they get a badge. They're treated as chaplains. They get a badge. They don't have to wear a hospital scrubs. They continue to wear a traditional shaman jacket. And they're there to um, do two things. One, to uh, assist the patients who are there among patients, but also to educate the doctors and the, and the, and the um, staff about what the cultural issues are for the Hmong population. There is a, an approved list of about a dozen ceremonies that the Hmong chaplains can perform just without anybody say so, and then they're fairly simple and short, and then a, a long, another list of more complicated ones that they can perform if appropriate arrangements are made ahead of time. Um, so now instead of waiting around to try the, net, the traditional way first and then go to the hospital, th they can get their Western medicine and their traditional healing at the same time. And it's very effective because, as we all know, a lot of healing in Western medicine has to do with your attitude and, and how you feel about things. Um, and so often they find the Western medicine wasn't working because the patient was so uncomfortable. And now they can get both their Western medicine and their um, traditional healing at the same time. They have a shaman serving on the hospital's advisory board to help them make sure the program um, goes forward. Another group that um, I want to talk about is outreach to refugees. We already heard from Anastasia about some of the unique problems that refugees face, the traumas that they have suffered, and the challenges that they face when they come to the United States. Um, in uh, Boise, Idaho, in 2009, they had an influx of about 1,200 refugees because Boise is a federal refugee uh, resettlement site. Mid uh, many people from Africa, many people from the Middle East, so St. Alphonsus, which is one of the two major health care providers in the area, got together with the resettlement agencies, the state and city refugee offices, social service providers, representatives, and focus groups that they conducted from the refugee communities themselves. And out of that, decided to make refugee care a top priority and developed two programs. One is a maternal um, health clinic where the refugee women who can come in and, again, they. These are women who have suffered really great physical and mental trauma, um, which um, causes them to have a lot of fear of the medical process, fear of doctors, fear of examination, and what was going to happen when people touch their body. And it means that many of them have unique medical conditions as a result. Um, so the Care Maternal Child Health Clinic um, provides a safe place where they can come they are uh, met a day ahead of their appointment and they're shown the place and, and it's explained to them how it will work and their questions are answered. They employ about a half dozen health advisors who are themselves settled refugee women who have been through the clinic. 
they offer uh, language services and over on-site immediate language services in over 15 languages to cover all these different groups. Um, and my time is ticking away, so I'm going to talk even faster, if you can believe it or not. <laughs> so they provide language services, transportation services. They take extra time to explain all the processes. Um, they provide mental, on-site mental health and uh, primary care, as well as well baby care once the, the children are born. They provide support groups so the women can talk together. In addition, St. Alphonsus, their, their uh, physician's medical group, runs a clinic and they, that focuses on refugees. 80% of their patients are refugees and they have a mobile clinic that they drive into the communities where the refugees have settled to be able to provide direct care to them um, in the places where they live. I think I'm going to... Uh, talk about just one more program because it illustrates a point that hasn't been made yet, and this is in Anchorage, Alaska. Actually, this is two points. So in Anchorage, Alaska, Providence Medical Center works with Catholic Social Services Refugee Assistance and Immigration Service to help provide, um, with, which is the refugee resettlement agency in that, in the, for Alaska, to help provide work, workforce training experiences to recent refugees. These are six months programs in the environmental department, the um, uh, environmental services, laundry services, and sterile processing, 20 hours a week, $10 an hour. So it's not, you know, it's sort of basic work, it's not a ton of money, but it's hands-on experience for people. But, you know, they're not really ready to be employed, they don't have their English down yet, they don't have the other things that they need, but they come in and for six months they get to have some on-the-job workforce training, make connections with the people that they work with, have ESL training. Um, many of the people have been hired afterwards as full-time employees by Providence, and some of them who haven't have gone on to get jobs elsewhere. So it's a really excellent transitional um, opportunity for them to get training and get some money as well. And I wanted to raise that for two reasons. One, this is the only example I have where we've partnered with Catholic Social Services. And that gets to the plea I want to make. We need to, we're all doing wonderful work, we've all heard about it, but I wish I'd heard more opportunities and I wish I could share more opportunities with you of examples of where we've collaborated with Catholic partners. And so when you are looking to work on different projects, when you have a problem you need, when you have services that you think need to be delivered and you're looking for partners, I really encourage you to turn to the Catholic Health Ministry in your community. They're well resourced usually, just to like hang that out, dangle that out. Um, I mentioned that they're required now to do community health needs assessments so you can get into the process of helping to figure out what the needs are. Um, they are, have a big incentive, apart from their own, our own faith-based, tradition-based incentive to do community benefit that's part of how they get their tax um, status. So they have a huge incentive to go out and try to do more community benefit work, and they're really eager to partner with Catholic partners. So um, I was going to talk a little bit about Catholic hospitals as employers because we do employ many immigrants, but I'm going to stop there because I really want the thing to linger in your mind is the breadth of kind of services that we provide and opportunities and um, really a plea to come and partner with us. Thanks. I just want to join my voice to those who are uh, grateful you know, to Don and uh, everybody who has put this together. But I also want to thank the faithful remnant here. You know, <laughs> just to, all of you, there is a, you know, after nine hours, 19 presentations or 17 presentations, you know, like two minute break, so that, that's a, so, something like that, you know. There's a word in Spanish for this, and it's uh, los valientes. <laughs> so all of you are the brave ones, so thank you for being valientes. Oh, you know? you told us you were the best talk. Oh, really? <laughs> so that's why you waited, eh? <laughs> the rest has all been hors d'oeuvres. There you have it. <laughs> Hey, I, I think that, you know, it's been a long day and I don't know, this is my presentation or my, my brief remarks, you know, bring together some initial insights of a national study that began in 2011, you know, for two years, a little bit, uh, two years and a half, you know, I and a team of uh, researchers have been working on uh, what's called the National Study of Catholic Parishes with Hispanic Ministry in the United States. This is the first time ever in the history of the United States that we have 
exclusively focus on a sociological study and an analysis of parish life where Latinos, Latinas are present. Okay? So let's imagine 1950s. Some of you may have been alive, don't raise your hands, you know. <laughs> 1950, about 95% of the Catholic population in the 1950s was Euro-American white, you know, mostly children of immigrants from Europe, Western Europe. Fast forward 50 years, close to 60 years. Today, about 40 to 45% of the entire Catholic population in the United States is Hispanic. 55% of all Catholics under the age of 18 are Hispanic. So the future, in some ways, speaks Spanish in terms of Catholicism in the United States. Not, and I'm not referring just to language, you know. As a matter of fact, most Hispanics in the United States are English speaking. So it's not about Spanish, per se. So, but what we are seeing is a major transformation. And I want to begin my, my, my brief remarks with three premises. First one is, we are in the midst of a major transformation about what it means to be Catholic, American Catholic, or U.S. Catholic. And I want to echo, for instance, the title of the book of my good friend, Timothy Matovina, who just wrote it, just published it a couple of years ago, Latino Catholicism transformation in the largest church, in America's largest church. And that's exactly what is happening. Major transformation. And when there's a major transformation, then structures are impacted, strained, challenged. And that's what's happening. And I am focusing, particularly with this study and with these remarks, on Catholic parishes. Catholic parishes in the United States are being called to rethink the way they form and develop community, Catholic community. And we cannot ignore this. We know that about 40% of all parishes in the United States celebrate masses in, language, in, in more than two languages, no? or a language other than English as well. But of, those 40 of that 40%, the vast majority more than 80% are parishes serving Hispanic Catholics. Let me give you a different number. In the United States, there are about 17,300 parishes in this country, no? So next week, the number will be different because a few will be closed, others will be you know, <laughs> open, so it always changes, no? But 4,300 of those parishes serve directly Hispanic Catholics and serve Hispanic Catholics who are Spanish-speaking primarily, okay? So that's the nature. So a full, almost a full quarter of parishes, or a full quarter of parishes in this country are serving Hispanic Catholics in, in Spanish. Not to mention those Catholics, those Latino Catholics, who do not worship in Spanish, but who worship primarily in English. And if you don't believe me, go to New Mexico. Texas, Arizona, where, that, where we are already seeing the, the, this big reality. Let me begin my presentation then, okay? That was my... So those are three premises. Oh, actually, you forgot the third premise, no? <clears throat> so the first one is major transformation. The second one is existing structures are being challenged. Where, and thirdly, there is a huge need. Every time there is a transformation, there is a need for emerging, for emerging structures for new structures. In other words, we are being called today, in 2014, 21st century, early 21st century, to developing creatively new ways of being parish, being American Catholic parish. So, to honor the theme of this conversation, immigration integration, or immigrant integration, so, what I have done is just venture into the data that I have collected over, over the last three years and just look at some criteria that point in the direction of integration, of parish integration. And what, what did I discover? What, what I discovered is that parishes in the United States serving Hispanic Catholics 
are like the US, uh, like the US Congress, okay? They are divided in three major groups. <laughs> and those three major groups are almost equally divided by thirds, no, by thirds. So what do we have? What we have here is parishes that a third of all parishes serving Hispanic ministry in the United States, based on the study and the projections, no, based on, on the responses, a third of all parishes serving Hispanic Catholics are parishes with low levels of integration. A third parishes with medium levels of integration, and a third parishes that are you know, ideally integrated or on the way, on the path to integration, high levels of integration. Let me give you some more statistics or, 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 or information here. So what we have here is that Parishes that are considered low, you know, with low levels of integration are parishes where you know, the ratio you know, in terms of membership to employers or to employees is two to one. In other words, representation matters, friends. Representation matters. If you have a large Latino population in your parish, but only one Latino person in, in, in positions of leadership, integration decreases in that particular community, no? And that doesn't happen only in parishes. It could happen in hospitals or schools or any other organization. That's, for instance, one of the cases of Catholic schools, no? Catholic schools, we could have as many Latino kids as possible. Yet, if we don't have enough Latino teachers and administrators, we, we, are, not, we, uh, we are diminishing the, 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 the capacity for success in these institutions. And it's been proven sociologically inside the church and outside the church. So in parishes with low levels of integration, there are fewer Hispanics that are registered, that participate in the life of the, of the, of the parish. parish uh, the parish is most likely to have merged or, for, or, or was formed as part of a new cluster or recently changed its structure. In other words, parishes with low levels of integration are parishes that are, tend to be unstable structurally. Unstable structurally. In terms of education, in these parishes, what we find is parents being less involved in the educational processes that the parish offers for faith formation. Parents do not get involved in religious education or adult faith formation. And also, in these parishes, notice this, you know, so English is the dominant language, 55, 51%, bilingual 20%, Spanish 29%, okay? Now, don't let the numbers deceive you because I'm, I'm gonna give you a, another set of numbers for a medium integration parish. For the medium integration parish, what do we see? In the medium integration parish, what we see is that there is a, no 80% of the expected leadership representation is present, okay? Meaning, on a, a percentage of membership to employee ratio, five to four. That means that these are parishes where we normally have a Latino parochial vicar. These are parishes where most likely we will have a Hispanic pastoral associate, or a pastoral associate who is fully bilingual, fully bicultural. In these parishes that are medium integration are communities that registration among Hispanics has increased. Why? Because Latinos, when the parish is more integrated, Latinos tend to name it as their own parish. They are not renting it. They are not just coming to these communities. And then half of masses are in Spanish on Sunday. So there are more, more services offered to, to, to serve Latinos. In terms of education, their parents are more, uh, are more involved in these communities. And also, there are more catechists working with youth, Hispanic youth. Now, notice the change in languages. The number of services and activities done in English in parishes where Latinos are more integrated, you know, instead of decreasing in, in English, decreasing, actually increases. It increases, and I, will, and I will tell you the, the main reason why, okay? So now in these communities, 60% of all activities in these integrated communities is English. 
bilingual about 8% and Spanish 32%. Can I interrupt you? Yes. 60%, does that mean 60% of the Latinos in the entire, entire parish? Is the, is includes, the parish. The, includes the English speakers. Includes okay. the English speakers, right, and Latinos. And then for the highly integrated communities, based on the data that we're collecting, so this is what we have. So we have a clear representation of leadership. The Latino community, so say if the Latino community is half of the entire parish, half of the staff and half of the leaders tend to be Hispanic, okay? And those are the communities that tend to exhibit the higher number of, in, the highest level of integration, at least in the data that we have collected. 63% of these communities have a secretary who speaks Spanish, which you know, could seem silly or, or an irrelevant issue, but as a matter of fact, there are countless parishes out there where there's a large Hispanic population, but the staff seldom or barely speak Spanish, or doesn't speak Spanish. 43% have a Hispanic deacon. So notice the correlation between leadership and integration. Half of the parish tends to be Hispanic, or more. Higher number of apostolic movements. Apostolic movements contribute to the integration of the parish. However, the data, and as you, you will see later, you know, when, when, the, when the, the, study, the results are released, the data shows that when apostolic movements work with the structures of the parish, they facilitate integration. When the, when, the, uh, when the movements, apostolic movements, as a matter of fact, separate from the structures of the parish, they hinder integration, okay? Parish, uh, parishes that are highly integrated tend to be more stable. They haven't changed dramatically in the last 10, 15 years. And in terms of education, they have the highest percentage of parents participating in the activities of, the, of education for their children. They get involved in schools, they get involved in, in faith formation programs, they get involved in many other activities, and the catechists are trained to work with Latino kids first, second, third generation. Finally, notice the number. Highly integrated communities are communities where English predominates. English predominates, still. Even though the majority of kids, or, I'm sorry, the majority of Latinos tend to be Hispanic. So, also, also, yes. How many have Hispanic priests, do you know? Most of these parishes tend to, do, to, tend to have, a, if not a pastor, a parochial vicar or Hispanic. Most of them, yes. So, what do we get, what do we gain from there? What, what do we learn from, the, from this data? We learn four major insights in terms of integration of, no, of Latinos, Latinas. I'm focusing exclusively on Latinos in this particular sample. So what do we learn from, the, from here? One, parishes that are stable facilitate no, vibrant Hispanic ministry and lead to integration. Parishes that are stable. Now, there is a phenomenon in many dioceses that when parishes close, particularly in the Northeast and the Midwest, parishes, when parishes close, many of the parishes that tend to close are parishes with minority groups in them. So then we have these you know, uh, somehow gypsy-like communities, you know, moving from community to community every two or three or four years. And that is a common. So that hinders, that movement hinders integration. So we need to make sure that our immigrants are being sent to communities that tend to be stable structurally, financially, ministerially. Second insight, the stronger the presence of Hispanic leaders in decision-making positions, the stronger the possibilities of integration for the immigrant community, okay? So the presence, we need to start empowering Latinos, Latinas, and in this case, that, that's the sample, but immigrants to take more ownership in leadership positions. You know, they are the ones who need to be pastors, pastoral associates, DREs. And the more, the, the more these people are in positions of leadership, the more integration we, move, uh, we, we can have. Thirdly, Spanish language, notice, is not the goal. 
99% of the sample that we, of the, five, of the almost 5,000 parishes that were part of the study defined Hispanic ministry as ministry to Spanish-speaking Catholics. However, what we are discovering through the data is that the goal is not to just exclusively separate the Latino community according to language. Of course, language needs to be used, primarily with the first generation, but the, the point here is that we need to pay attention to the fact that the vast majority of Latinos in the United States are already second, third, or post-immigrant. We are treating Latinos as immigrants still. According to the Census Office, 63% of all Latinos in the United States were born in this country. So we are not, we are not talking about an immigrant community. It's a community that is U.S. born, U.S. raised, okay? And therefore, that explains why English tends to be the dominant language in, in communities that are more stable. And finally, parental participation is very important. The involvement of families, the involvement of parents in faith formation programs, the involvement of parents in, 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 in religious education in Catholic schools is very important. It pains me to hear about parishes where you know, they, have, they have decided to adopt the only English policy. You know? So they only train children in, in, in English, but they disconnect those children from their families, or disconnect those children from their parents. Catholic schools that do not have bilingual personnel and are trying to reach out to, to Hispanic families are somehow shooting themselves in the foot, you know? Because there is a strong sense of family and community in, the, in, this, in, this Latino community, in these Latino families that we need to build upon instead of break apart, okay? I guess that for now, this, is, this, this would be, would be some, some good insights emerging. So the study, was, the, the results are gonna, be, uh, uh, are gonna be released towards the month of May, so most likely there will be a, a list served you know, for those who participated in this, uh, in this conference. You know, I'll make sure that all of you receive about uh, this. So there will be a series of reports on pastors' theories, of Catholic schools in the fall, during the fall semester. There will be two books coming out of this project. You know, one is the analysis of the data, another one is more of a theoretical framework that will emerge. So, stay tuned, my friends. Thank you. <laughs> Unbelievable information from all three of the panelists. Uh, we probably only have a couple of minutes, but uh, are there questions that or comments? You obviously know what separates you from dinner. <laughs> Don, anything? Um. I, I don't have questions or comments on the panel other than that it was a phenomenal panel, so thank you very much for that. Um, just in terms of what we're going to do next, we'll have you know the video of this available. Um, we will post presentations and PowerPoints if the presenters want to give them to us, we'd be happy to do that. And uh, we're going to be meeting tomorrow with the advisory groups group on next steps in the project, and we'll share that with everybody as soon as that's available as well. So that, for me, that's it. I don't, I, and I really want to thank everybody for coming. I thought, you know, it was a remarkable day, and it's just remarkable to be spending time with so many, um, so many experts, and so many good and committed people. So thank you for that.